Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for having me here today. Um, so we are going to be talk well, we are talking about audiences today. And um, I was actually thinking about that word, audience, and I feel like we've used it for a really long time in marketing. But over the last couple of years, we've started to use it more and more and more. And I love that we're getting more focused on the people that we're trying to connect with in the world uh, with our brands and businesses that a lot of us work with. Um, I also feel like it's a word that started to make people nervous, right? There's so much complexity now, and we uncovered some of that in the panel before. Um, and someone said to me recently, well, what do we actually mean by audience, right? Like, what does that word mean? Um, and I said this, which is really my definition of audience at the simplest level, which is a group of people with something in common. And the thing that they have in common makes them more likely to behave in a certain way or buy something, right? That, for me, is the simplest definition of audience in terms of how I think about it. Um, I would say I think there is sort of one word of caution when we use, the, use this word, audience, because I think one of the associations we have with that word is sort of a group of people passively sitting there ready to receive our message or a performance of some kind. And we all know that audiences today aren't like that, right? They're not sitting there kind of eagerly waiting for the things that we'll give them, the advertising we'll give them. You know, they're messy, audiences overlap, people are part of multiple different communities, um, and we have to work really hard creatively to engage them and sort of get their time. Um, the other thing I was thinking about uh, when I think about audiences, and I think, again, this is something that's changed in the last sort of 10 years, is that once upon a, upon a time, from a brand's point of view, you did have a sort of audience that was a little bit more passive and singular and easy to engage with. But because of the many multiple platforms that we're all engaging with today, every, everyone who's part of your audience has their own audience, right? And those individuals are thinking about, how do I share content? How do I entertain the people in my audience? So there are new complex dynamics at play when we think about audience and the, the ecosystem of audiences that we're, that we're looking to engage. Um, the previous panel obviously touched on this, but you know, again, one of the huge things that's changed when we think about audiences is just the sheer diversity of data sources that we have available. So whether that's CRM and purchase data, whether that's location data, attitudinal data, um, you know, the ability for us to do one-to-one -one and personalization at scale. There are so many new sources, like an overwhelming uh, treasure trove of, of data. And obviously, so much of what we're trying to do at McCann World Group, and I suspect <laughs> lo lots of you are trying to do this as well, which is figure out how we bring those sources together, how we fuse the data, what that looks like, um, and there's just an amazing amount that we can do and we will do more and more going into the future. Um, but I did want to say a, a point about one sort of type of data that I feel has become less relevant, um, and that's demographic-driven data. And this is quite significant because I think if you look to sort of 10, 20 years ago in brand strategy, so much was driven by demographics. You know, when clients were creating their audience segmentations, it would so often begin with a story that was driven by demographics, right? Like, let's talk about empty nesters. And you would assume that all of those people had something in common that was being driven by those demographics. But we see that that's less and less the case, right? And that creates new opportunities. It also creates new complexities for us as we try to understand audiences. Um, and I wanted to make this point by talking about a piece of research, first of all, that we did at McCann World Group that was called The Truth About Age. And we were trying to understand um, the degree to which age is influencing things like behaviors and attitudes. Um, and we uncovered some pretty interesting data. So for example, if we take an attitude like, um, you're never too old to casually date, 62% of people in their 20s agree with that. 
71% of people in their 70s agree with that, right? So we start to see that what you might assume for an age group is no longer true because attitudes are evolving and they're no longer correlated with age groups in simplistic ways. Um, but we can also look at behaviors. And again, this is claimed behavior. We know that all of those data sources we saw before are helping us to close the gap between say and do. But in terms of claimed behaviors, we ask people, how often a week are you exercising? Are you playing online games? And are you being physically intimate with another person? And again, here, you see there's not a huge amount of difference between people in their 20s and people in their 70s. So again, maybe we have to check some of our assumptions around age groups. Um, and now I have a question for everyone in the audience, um, which is, on a scale of 1 to 10, where 1 is not old at all, and 10 is I feel very, very old. How, what are you on that scale, right? Where are you between one and 10? Fran, where are you? Well, I think I'm a solid six. He's a six, okay, interestingly. Jess, where are you? She's a 10, she's a 10. She feels so old and yet she is so young in her, in her years. But um, so anyway, we asked this uh, in, a, in a survey and people in their 20s, said, on average, I'm a four. People in their 30s said, on average, I'm a five. People in their 40s, on average, are a five. People in their 50s, on average, are a five. People in their 60s, also a five. And people in their 70s, also a five. So what this tells us is that while the number might be going up, you know, your turns around the sun, um, People never feel any older, right, from an attitudinal point of view. So again, it tells us that we can't make simplistic, simplistic assumptions around demographics anymore. And this is really interesting from a brand's and, and business's point of view, because we also ask people, to what extent do you feel the brands and businesses understand you, understand the aging population? And generally speaking, people feel misunderstood, right? They don't feel that brands are representing aging or the process of aging in a way that connects with them personally. So we know there's a big opportunity here. And from a communications point of view, from the narrative we see in the media, so often this is how aging is presented in the world. You know, the first half of your life is presented as this process of gains, um, growth, limitless opportunities, but more and more people feel that when they look at the narrative in the world, the second half of life is presented as a process of loss, a process of decline, um, a process of limits. And actually, for the majority of people, the humans in our research, when we talk to them about the process of aging, they said, actually, I think my life has got better over time. I think my life is fuller and happier in my 50s and 60s and 70s, but I feel like society is conspiring to try and convince me otherwise. So just a really interesting sort of human-driven insight that came from you know, traditional market research. But I think from a brand strategy point of view, we can take a human insight like that. It can lead to really interesting creative opportunities. So one of our clients is L'Oreal, um, and L'Oreal actually pioneered a collaboration with Vogue, um, and they launched together Vogue's non-issue, which was a celebration of sort of ageless style and beauty. Um, and it was about saying aging should no longer be an issue, right? Aging should not be an issue for women because you can be beautiful and happy and successful and enjoy growth at any age. So that research, that insight, that process led to this amazing uh, piece of creative work that was um, incredibly successful as a collaboration. So um, I guess this presentation overall is a little bit of a, a, a love letter to, I guess, um, human universal insight. So despite the capabilities we have from an audience point of view to go really, really see, uh, super deep, find those niches, we should also make sure that we raise our heads above the parapet and connect with those universal truths that are so powerful when we think about global brands. Because again, whilst we have all of this amazing data, and I'm obsessed with this data, and I'm always thinking about how we use it more effectively, 
I don't want to lose sight of the humans behind the data because respondents are people. Uh, sample sizes are really just communities representing their societies. Data is a way of simplifying emotions, feelings, and attitudes. And research and data, above all, should tell us a story um, that we can use to inspire brands and businesses and, and clients. And behind every questionnaire, every survey, every sample group is a human being. And I think we have to think about that um, because you know, I think we're all aware in this world of some of the changing rules around privacy. You know, I'm sure that idea of using all of those data sources in a really ethical way is really important to, to all of us. And I think if we stay close to this, that sort of helps being, uh, that's a compass going forward. But I think unearthing those universal human truths is a way that we can do amazing strategy and creative work for some of the world's biggest global brands. Um, we talked a little bit about qualitative research earlier, and I think from our point of view, yes, we're obsessed with the data and the quantitative data, but we're always innovating new ways of doing qualitative research as well and getting to those deeply human stories. So, for example, when we wanted to find out the truth about wellness, we went around the world in 80 bathroom cabinets. So we took photos of bathroom cabinets all around the world, and then we worked with an anthropologist who decoded those bathroom cabinets. Uh, we also have an initiative at McCann World Group that we call Truth About Street, um, and we get every one of our World Group employees, thousands and thousands of them all around the world, they actually go out to the, onto the streets for one day, and they observe what they see in their cities and their cultures, they ask people questions, because we believe that it's everybody's responsibility to be a truth hunter um, and find those universal human audience insights. The other thing that we're really, really passionate about um, in Truth Central, which is the group I run at World Group, is we need to look in different places, right? We need to, uh, I think it came up on the panel earlier, right? Like everybody's looking at the same data sources. We want to make sure as much as possible we're trying to look in different places. But also when we do traditional market research, we want to make sure that we're trying to ask different questions, the kind of questions that we don't think other people are asking. So um, when we were trying to understand parents as an audience, um, obviously we can ask them things about, you know, how do you feel about giving your, food uh, giving your children healthy food or what you think it means to be a good parent? But we can also ask them really fun and creative questions um, in quantitative research. So we said to parents, what's the thing most you wish that your phone could do for you? Um, so hands up who thinks what the answer is here. So uh, number one, who thinks parents said, I would like my phone to help me to time travel? Who thinks uh, parents would like their phone to help them calm the kids down? Who thinks uh, they'd like their phone to help them see into the future? And who thinks they would like their phone to cook dinner for me? Yes. I get that, cook dinner. I would like my phone to cook dinner for me. That's, uh, that would be amazing. But you will be surprised to see that the number one answer globally was to let them time travel. And I think this is really interesting because in the context of the pandemic, I think everybody started to develop a very strange relationship with time, right? People lost sense of what the month was, what the year was. They felt that their life had been interrupted and they were losing control of time. So to me, it's actually not that surprising that parents are like, I wish I had more control of time. I wish I could see, you know, move into the future or reclaim control of the past. Um, so when we tried to do sort of research to understand Gen Z and youth audiences, you know, rather than just look at their relationship with technology, we also asked them some really simple human questions, like when did you have your first romantic kiss? And we asked this globally of, of young people around the world. So again, who thinks the global average is 14? Who thinks it's 19? Who thinks it's 16? And who thinks it's 21? Okay, so I think a couple of people got this right. 
left is 19. Remember, there's a spectrum, right? So in some countries, I think here in the UK, it was 15 or 16. But then you're going to find other markets where it's much older than that. So again, that's a, that's a global average. But it's a really interesting way of us starting to think about cultural differences. Um, and then finally, uh, obviously, it, we've already talked about it today, um, you know, AI and the intersection between technology and creativity, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about in a minute. But um, we asked people the question, <laughs> which profession is most likely to say that their job is too complicated for a robot to do well? Who thinks it's healthcare professionals? Who thinks hospitality workers? Who thinks the armed forces? Who thinks artist slash graphic designer? So I can tell you it's healthcare professionals, which I'm OK with. I think I don't want hospitals full of, full of robots. But um, I would say you know, the vast majority of people still think that their, their job is too complicated for, for sort of AI to take over, more than 70% of artists and graphic designers. I would say um, Jess and I, who I work with here, we just fielded another survey and we asked people um, which professions they thought were most vulnerable in terms of being sort of taken over by AI. Got some bad news for those of you who work in marketing, <laughs> right up there as one of the most vulnerable um, professions. So, you know, we all know that this is something we're going to be thinking about more and more, more and more deeply over the coming months and years. But I think this is a really interesting question for us to reflect on you know, as we talk about audiences today. To what extent is AI going to change the way we think about audiences and approach audiences? You know, and we know that you know, there is huge power in applying AI to the data sets that we're already looking at. You know, we are going to be able to do amazing things with causal AI in terms of looking at cause and effect in the data, correlations in the data, pattern recognition at scale. It is going to allow us to do amazing things. Um, but we had a, a day uh, a couple of weeks ago at McCann World Group where we got <clears throat> like 100 leaders together. And it was a day of talking about AI and the intersection with our industry and creativity. We also did training for, for, for everybody. And as a group, we sat down and we used chat GPT together to solve strategic problems. We used mid-journey to come up with design and creative ideas, and then we pitched them to each other. And it was really interesting. It was also the first time that the enormity of the disruption that this is going to bring to our industry like really hit me for the first time. I was like, oh, this is a, this is a seismic transition in the way that we work. And uh, we had a panel discussion afterwards. And one of the questions that we were being asked by the moderator was, um, what are you scared of and what are you hopeful about when you think about the future of AI and its intersection with our industry? And I was thinking, do you know what? I am anxious. Like, I am nervous when I think about the, <laughs> the intersection of AI with my job and my world. Um, but then I thought about this film. And it made me feel more hopeful. Um, hands up, who's seen the film Good Will Hunting? Um, so I don't know if any of you remember this scene, but um, for anyone who hasn't seen it, the Matt Damon character, he's sort of like a genius. He's read everything. He knows everything. Um, and Robin Williams is his therapist. And he's very stressed, but he's, he's like, how am I going to connect with this guy? He's so arrogant. He's so difficult to communicate with because he knows everything, right? He's read everything. Um, and he says to Matt Damon character, I was up all night worrying about you and how I was going to be a therapist to you. He was like, and then I, re and then I realized something, and I felt OK. I remembered that you are just a kid. And if I asked you about art, and Michelangelo, you could tell me everything that's ever been written about him. But you can't tell me what it smells like in the Sistine Chapel. And he said, if I asked you about women, OK, maybe you could tell me every love sonnet that's ever been written. But you don't know what it feels like to hold the hand of the woman you love who's dying of cancer. You know, and you're, you don't know what that feels like. And I was like, that helps me <laughs> feel better about the intersection of AI and our world. 
But I do think it's a challenge to human civilization to dig really deep into the things that make us human. So that conversation about the why is really, really important. And we do need to stay close to the why of, of audiences, because I think understanding humans is going to become so much more important to the future of audience thinking. Um, and now I'm over time. Do I have like two more minutes just to share this final example? Two minutes? Um, so I wanted to leave you with one final story, which is, I think, one of the most interesting pieces of research we did from a human point of view was the truth about diversity, which is such a big, messy, complicated subject. Uh, we did a massive piece of research, more than 30,000 respondents globally. And one of the things we discovered is that the vast majority of people understand the value of diversity. And the number of people who understand the value is going up over time. So 67% uh, of people last year believe that society is stronger if we have a group of people who look different and think differently and they come together to solve problems. However, what we could also see in the data, in the research, is that there is this gulf between the principles of what we think diversity should be and the theory of it and what we say and the reality of how we actually behave on a daily basis and the extent to which we are actually advocating for DE&I. So we, um, we looked at audiences through the lens of diversity and we uncovered these sort of five core mindsets. And this was really interesting for us. It was a real breakthrough because at either end of the spectrum, you've got your diversity deniers. Um, so these are the people who do not think DE&I is a good idea. They're quite resistant. Um, at the other end, you've got your change champions. And this is a global segmentation, by the way. These are the people who are out on the streets sort of fighting the fight. But the vast majority of people are somewhere in the middle. And the interesting thing about the three groups in the middle is we call them the yes but segments because they will all say that they care about diversity, right? They'll all say DE&I is important, but they are motivated quite differently. So um, our protect protectionist purists, who are 17% of people, say, um, yep, diversity is great. I just don't really think it should be in my backyard. So I kind of, I like it in theory for other people. I just get a bit nervous when it's kind of in my community. Uh, then we have our sideline sitters who are like, yeah, diversity is great. It's really important. It's not really my fight, though. Right? It's not something I need to work on as an individual. And then finally, our cultural conformists say, yeah, yeah, diversity is all well and good, but it's not a problem in my country or, or in, my, in my company. Right? We don't have an, have an issue with that. So we started to unpack the different reason, reasons that certain audiences were not engaging with DE&I. But we also discovered something interesting in the data, which is these two audiences at either end of the spectrum, on the surface, look like they are polar opposites in terms of values. But the thing we noticed in the data, both in the quant and the qual, is that they are both really engaged. They are way more engaged than those audiences in the middle. And the thing that really unifies them is this idea that they can engage with human stories, right? They're interested in people. They're interested in um, connecting with those human narratives. And I think um, this is sort of one of the thoughts that I want to leave you with from the point of view of global brands in particular. It's those human stories, those universal human insights that have the power to connect audiences across the divide. And I think. We should always keep that in mind, even as we have the ability to sort of create so many niche audiences and, you know, personalization at scale. Um, and then I wanted to just leave you with a piece of work that we created for Microsoft a couple of years ago. And um, Microsoft had a technology that they'd created for gamers. It's called um, the Adaptive Controller. And um, they created this... Um, they created this technology for children who were unable to use the standard controller, right? And they saw it as a fairly sort of niche technology. But through conversations with the client, um, we said, actually, we think this is a niche technology, but there's a mainstream story here because we think everyone can get excited about the way you've innovated this technology. And it became the heart of a Super Bowl 
commercial, so very, very mainstream opportunity. Um, and it was incredibly successful and well received. So I just want to play that to you, and that will be the end of the presentation. My name is Grover. Sean. My name is Ian. I'm Taylor. My name is Owen, and I am nine and a half years old. So Owen was born with a rare genetic disorder called Escobar syndrome. He's had 33 surgeries to date. I love video games, my friends, my family, and again, video games. It's his way of interacting with his friends when he can't physically otherwise do it. What I like about the adaptive controller is now everyone can play. You can just say, all right, that's that button, that's that button, that's that button. Perfect. One of the biggest fears early on is, how will Owen be viewed by the other kids? <laughs> He's not different when he plays. No matter how your body is or how fast you are, you can play. It's a really good thing to have in this world. So uh, a really beautiful piece of research, an innovation that came from, you know, a minority audience but led to a mainstream insight and story that so many people uh, connected with. So thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.